Welcome to Daily Dose of Reddit. This is your host, Captain Zach. Today, we are reading from r slash pro Episode 100. What's that? All right, this story's called, He Punched Me Over a Fender Bender, I Destroyed His Life. I was working as a civilian with the U.S. military overseas, and I lived off base in an apartment complex among the U.S. military. One morning, I accidentally hit another soldier's vehicle. Upon exiting the vehicle, I noticed that both of our vehicles were what you call a hoopty. A hoopty is an old car that is pretty beat up that has been passed around from service to service member and they generally sell for $1,000 to $2,000. I also recognized that I was at fault for the accident. It was a very minor accident. His rear bumper was dented in slightly, but I could hear both our cars still running. I approached the driver who had already gotten out and he was in uniform and I apologized and said if it was alright with him, I'd like to negotiate a payment that I'll pay him in cash and we don't involve the authorities. I wanted to keep this simple. I'll be honest, the accident was so minor, I honestly expected him to say, Nah, man, it's good. But even if he wanted some money, I'd have paid him. I've always been of the opinion, if you have a fender bender and can negotiate agreeable terms between both parties, it's best to not involve insurance or the police. He told me he wanted to call the police. I said we could call the police, or we could go on base together and I could give him $300. He said that wasn't enough, so I upped my my offer to $500. He proceeded to punch me in the face. It was a sucker punch. He got into his car and took off, and in the process, nearly ran me over. Now, I had a black box in my car which recorded everything. I went to the Provost Marshal Office on base, the police station, and reported the accident and the assault and showed the MP the footage, which they used his license plate to track him down. I was also asked if I wanted to involve the local local authorities or press criminal charges off base. Honestly, I felt like the soldier would learn his lesson if I let UMCJ, the military court basically, handle this. And I said, not at this time. I was told it was an option. The end result was the soldier in question got 60 days of extra duty, reduction in rank, and forfeited a portion of his paycheck. Essentially, if he dealt with that, this would have been the end of the whole ordeal. Honestly, at this point, I assumed our little ordeal was over. Well, a few days after his punishment was decided on, which was not long after the incident itself, I was in the commissary, grocery store on base, shopping when the soldier who assaulted me saw me and began to insult me. I told him he needed to calm down, that he should learn his lesson. He told me I was a pusillanimous individual who didn't know how to take a punch. I reminded him that I held back on destroying his life. He told me he's already been punished and I can't touch him again. He left me be. A store employee witnessed the entire encounter and I got the employee's details and reported this interaction to his command. His commander told me he had been ordered to not interact with me and would take action. His commander also recommended I involve the local authorities since this soldier obviously isn't learning his lesson. So I did. I contacted an attorney. The attorney was unsure if we could successfully see the soldier and said he would need a cash payment to take the case. Honestly, I was mad and I wanted to teach this guy a lesson. I agree, it was not cheap. To keep the story short, we ended up in a court off base. We presented our evidence. The soldier in question had decided to represent himself. Several times in court, he had outbursts. The judge ended up granting me a judgment of approximately $50,000 US. When the judgment was given, Given, the soldier called the judge a son of a female dog and that the army would cover for him. So the judge changed his judgment to $80,000 and the judge then asked me if I also wanted to press charges against the soldier in criminal court. Honestly, it was obvious the guy wasn't going to learn a lesson. I told the judge I wanted to pursue criminal charges in addition to the judgment. My lawyer later advised
advise me that if I ever wanted to see the money, I should pursue an international hold. With my judgment, it's likely that a judge would grant me an international hold. An international hold is basically where this soldier would not be allowed to leave the country until I was paid my $80,000. Also, he told me that according to the agreement between the US military and the host country, the US military would honor the international hold. Basically, the US military would not protect him or move him out of country to avoid punishment. Honestly, by this point, I had paid my lawyer thousands of dollars and I honestly didn't feel like paying thousands of dollars and getting nothing for it. So I said yes, I wanted to go forward with the international hold. About a month later, the international hold was granted. Take a shot every time I say international hold, starting 15 minutes ago. <laughs> Story's not even that long. About a month later, the international hold was granted. And and the US military was informed of this. Two months after that, the criminal case was over and the soldier was sentenced to 90 days in jail. By this point, the soldier had been moved onto the base into his barracks by his commander. I remember the day I was informed. The MPs handed him over to the local authorities to begin his 90 day jail sentence. Did I mention he still owed me $80,000? I heard nothing for a year and then one one day I get a call from his commander. His commander wants me to make a statement in regards to the case. I go in and make the states. During the statement, I find out that the US military was in the process of chaptering the soldier out of the US military. The commander also informed me that he was close to coming up with the money to pay me so he could have the international hold lifted. The commander also asked me if my lawyer would be willing to make a state. I contacted my lawyer who also made a statement about the facts of the case. A few weeks later, his ex-wife contacted me. When this all started, I knew he was married. Guess his wife decided to divorce him. She informed me that his ex-husband had the money and needed the details on how to pay me. I provided her the details, and a few days later, I got the payments and contacted his ex-wife to inform her I had been paid. She then asked me to send a receipt so he could have the international hold lifted and return to the States. I asked her how he got the money. She said he maxed out his credits and also had family to help out. Also during this conversation, I had found out the army had chaptered him out of the military. I sent to the receipt and that was the last I ever heard from his side. Frequently asked questions. This post blew up. I turned off inbox replies because it was too much. So I felt like answering some common questions. Am I worried about the guy getting revenge on me? No, he's back in the States. I'm still overseas. He most likely has a criminal record, which means he wouldn't even be allowed past immigration. Plus, since then, I've taken a new job, moved, etc. Not connected to this incident. Just how things are. Plus, this happened many years ago. The amount seems high? The actual amount was in foreign currency, and I rounded up and adjusted figures, but it was very high. I did suffer from a black eye, and his behavior after the fact didn't help. Also, this incident happened in an Asian country during a time period in which we had several other high profile incidents with US service members screwing up. My incident was not high profile at all, but that all played a role. Honestly, I expected around $15,000 to $20,000. <laughs> also in this country, settlements for damages are based upon your ability to pay and tend to be on the higher side. I think the court also thought he was an American and could afford it. However, the amount even shocked my lawyer. Why did his commander recommend I take this to civil authorities? I got the feeling his commander was tired of this soldier. I suspect I wasn't the first incident. What country did this happen in? I don't wish to disclose that. However, several people in the comment section have guessed correctly. Actually, someone who is familiar with the incident PM'd me. So this blew up more than I intended. I will say this, it happened in Asia in a country with a large troop presence. I say, I'm not gonna guess, I'm stupid, but I'm gonna say it's probably somewhere in, in Asia, maybe on that one half, that one, that one place where troops. Why did I go so far? Honestly, that was never my intention. In fact, I decided to report to the military instead of going straight to the local authorities because I figured doing so would allow us to deal with the issue in-house and his punishment would be limited. I was right. He didn't learn his lesson. However, once I got the local authorities and my lawyer involved, it turned into something I didn't expect. Also, by the time that dust had settled, I had paid my lawyer a significant sum of money, had to use up my vacation days. In total, this entire incident 
cost me many thousands of dollars in lawyer costs, vacation time, etc. So I did want my money back at that point. Why did he get a jail sentence for simple assault? So in this country, they do not like to give suspended sentences to foreigners. I suspect a local national would have gotten a suspended sentence. I do have a local national friend who was involved in an assault many years ago, and he got a 90-day suspended sentence. However, my guess is the judge gave him jail time instead of a suspended sentence because he was a foreigner. However, I was not involved very much in the criminal case. Questions about his wife and ex-wife. Truth be told, I don't know much about this. I do not know if she was his ex-wife because of this or not. I also never saw his ex-wife in person. The only involvement I had with her at the very end was at the very end. Wow, man. You know what? I appreciate the hesitant lashback because you really didn't want this guy to get screwed over because it, like it, it's that's a good thing you know you really just wanted to keep it simple so you know everyone could just go about this you know as conveniently as possible conveniently as possible and then he had to get all handsy with you and that's i get you man i get you and i really appreciate the restraint it's good that he's out of the military now because we don't need we don't need hotheads in there because you know you see where that leads who knows there could be cyborgs in the military we just don't know about it i'm sorry i watched that uh, that joe rogan podcast with uh, alex jones like the whole almost five hour long show and ah it's the goddamn elves bro they're a problem in the elder scrolls universe they're a problem in this one this story's called no changes can be made without the account holder malicious compliance thought this belonged here and a power tripping mod over there decided to remove the original post after breaking his own commenting rules and getting called out yikes oh snap snap Woo! reddit t over here just spilled and i have electronics it's a bad day whoa oh, shoot ah oh, powering off <laughs> I'm sorry. A recent story reminded me of this act of malicious compliance by a family member. This family member's spouse past was involved in an accident that left them critically injured. They were in the ICU for months and would face permanent disability upon returning home. They didn't want to leave their home. It was close to the best hospital in the region and it was their forever home, so plans began to renovate it for accessibility. In addition to the renovations, a wheelchair van was going to be needed needed, along with other medical equipment for home use. As she worked on all of this, it was clear that large expenditures were going to be needed, and it was going to take time to draw money out of long-term savings and retirement accounts. So she called the credit card companies to get their limit increased. Sadly, before the renovations were complete, her spouse passed away after almost six months of hospitalization and therapy. Now attention turned to final arrangements. The couple had always been frugal and made maintain nearly perfect credit. All cards were being paid on time and despite carrying a balance on some cards from the construction, demolition had already started so renovations had to continue, but at a slower pace, money was now coming in from those long-term savings. The problem is, one major credit card company refused to work with her. She tried to access the account and was told, sorry, I had to speak to the account holder. She explained that her spouse had passed away and she was wanting to pay what was left on the card. She also explained that she was an account holder. Evil Bank stated that she was not on the account. She was a mere card holder and she had no rights to the account. The person on the phone explained that her husband opened the account without her and just gave her the card. She just didn't understand how credit cards worked. This was a lie. The couple had always been joint account holders on everything since they were first married for exactly this reason. They had done extensive estate planning and made sure that that all their assets were protected in trust should the worst occur. They knew their kids would be cared for and their partner would be able to access everything. Also, she ran the couple's business for over a decade, navigating a sea of regulations, insurance company billing and payroll finances, taxes. Needless to say, she did not enjoy being condescended on. Or is it two? Is I think it'd be on. I could be wrong, two, say two. Unfortunately, Evil Bank would not budge. They would not allow any access to the account for any reason, but for some reason, they didn't cancel the card after finding out the sole account holder had passed away. This back and forth went on for weeks, with multiple calls to the evil bank and trying to escalate the issue to supervisors to address the state of the account. In a final attempt to show evil bank 
that they were hurting themselves by this, so I'm unable to access any part of the account even to make a payment. That's right! So, the account is going to be closed. Now, only the account holder can do that, even though the account holder is dead. Only the account holder, ma'am! So, what does that mean for card holders and being able to charge the account? Only the account holder can deactivate a card or modify the account. So, what happens if a card holder uses their card? They can continue to use the card until the account holder tells us otherwise. The deceased account holder. Yes, I can't help you with anything else. You need to put the account holder on the phone if you want to change anything or make a payment. No, that's fine. She broke down crying immediately after, but decided that they set the rules so she would play by them. All the final expenses, medical bills, and as much construction cost as possible was put onto that credit card. She maxed it out, then let it sit until the credit card company started calling for payment. I'm sorry, per your policy, I'm just the card holder, and I'm not responsible for any balance. Ma'am, this balance needs to be paid or it will affect your credit. It better not. I'm not on the account. This is an illegal collections call, and I will be reporting it to the FTC and the attorneys general in your home state and mine. I'll have his number on speed dial. You can make your case to the court. She was used to getting medical insurance companies to pay claims for the last decade or so. You didn't want to play hardball with her. Remember how all the assets were in trusts? On paper, her partner had no assets to place a lien on. All the cash in the joint checking account had been used to pay expenses for the last several months, and withdrawals from long-term savings were sent to her account, not the joint account. They had agreed to move all exposed assets shortly after her partner regained consciousness, fearing the worst. Plus, all the income from the business had been brought home in her name for more than a decade, so she would actually get some kind of social security payment when she got older. So not only did his estate have no assets to go after, he didn't have an income for the last decade. Evil Bank was left with a maxed out credit card and no assets in the estate they could file against for payment. The handfuls of other credit card companies worked with her to raise limits temporarily or remove daily spending caps for large expenditures, and they were all paid without a single missed, late, or partial payment. Evil Bank had to eat a five-figure loss, all because they decided that the wife didn't deserve to be on the account from day one. She had every intention to pay every bill and expense. She has never been one to try to scam or cheat someone. She gave Evil Bank every chance to accept the money for the bill. They repeatedly refused to acknowledge her as a spouse or executor, or executor, sorry. <laughs> Uh, but she sure liked the irony of the only company that refused to acknowledge the death of her spouse ended up paying for the funeral expenses. hey -oh. Credit card companies suck! They're evil! <laughs> Just, uh, says the guy who doesn't like paying his bills. Um, <laughs> I'm, I do, I do. I don't like, like, right? Who likes paying for stuff? <laughs> Just give me free things. But anyway, first of all, spouse, you, were, no, OP's friend, you, you a real one. Spouse that passed away, rest in peace. But OP's friend, you're a champ. You are a champ. Evil Bank, you suck, and I would love to do service with you. Just, uh, let me fake my death afterwards so I don't have to pay off my massive credit card bill that I will accrue, because I will buy like 45 PS5s. Who needs that many? Me, because I'm heartbroken. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode.